so um, welcome everyone uh, to the first natural history section meeting of 2021. We're uh, very pleased uh, this evening to have with us Chris Leach from the British Plant Gall Society. Uh, anyone who's heard Chris talk before uh, knows that he is uh, a very uh, entertaining as well as informative speaker. So uh, we've been looking forward to this, Chris, and uh, it's over to you for your talk. Well, thank you very much, Alan. Uh, it's nice to have the invitation. Uh, this will be my third presentation to the uh, Lester Lytton Phil. Uh, the first one is in the 1990s when I was uh, talked with slides and the old Kodak carousel uh, gave a range of golf forms and so on and so forth and looked at the range. Another one in the noughties when we got onto PowerPoint uh, and we talked about the new invaders. And tonight we're doing over the ether, which is uh, quite interesting to do. Um, but I'm, uh, I've, the title I've chosen, The Challenging World of Plant Goals, I won't explain at the moment. I think hopefully by the time we get to the end, uh, you'll understand what I'm doing. What is a goal? This is a, we always start with this. A goal is an abnormal growth produced by a plant under the influence of another organism. That I think we all know and it involves enlargement and proliferation of uh, host cells and provides nutrients, shelter and protection of the goal, for the goal causer. And tonight's talk is really focusing on this notion that goals provide a nice place for goal causers, but it also provides a nice place to be for other things that want to take over the source of nutrients, the shelter and protection. Uh, and so no more ado, we'll start with looking at the diversity of gold courses very briefly. I don't expect you to read all of this. Uh, there are about 1800 different species of plant gold causes. And to put that into context, if you add up all the British mammal species, add that to all the British bird species and add that to all the British reptiles, add that to all the amphibians we find in this country and add that to the number of species of fish that we find in our waters, then gall courses are about two to three times more numerous than all of those species put together. So it's not a rare phenomena, it's a very uh, widespread phenomena very large numbers uh, and the real problem that we have is that there's such a variety of organisms that can cause galls. Uh, I've put a list here, cynipids, wasps, sawflies, so on, aphids, mites, nematodes, and because Brian, I knew Brian might be here, I thought I'd better put fungi in as well. Um, and these are really quite disparate. Now I can't cover the 1800 species tonight, so I've selected three types, the cynipids, the aphids, and the mites. And I've chosen those three because they are quite distinct in terms of the way they try to solve the problems of others muscling in on their goals. Right, we'll start with cynipids. Hopefully you can all hear me. <laughs> right. These are typical uh, cynipid wasps. Uh, the one at the top left-hand corner is uh, Andricus calari that produces the marble gall. Um, the one on the top right is uh, Andricus uh, quercus callosus that produces nophagols or induces the formation of nophagols. And the little black beast at the bottom is Neurotrus quercus baccarum, which produces spangle galls. They are quite distinct but they all have the same kind of general morphology, a head, thorax, abdomen, narrow waist, and so on. In the larval form, they're not very motile. Now this is uh, the larva out of a cherry gall, and you can see that the legs are merely just sort of little blobs. It, these uh, little legs, I wish I had a pointer that I could point to them. Uh, the heads, they're not very big, their jaws are not very big at all. They're really almost sessile and they live in the chamber and you can see the chamber on the slide 
from this sign of a goal. And the thing I want you to remark on is that it looks disgustingly clean. Nothing, no frass, no nothing. And this is because these beasts have blind guts, they don't excrete, and they live within this chamber eating that whitish tissue that around the edge, uh, which is the nutritious layer, and followed by a, a hard coat called a sarenchyma coat, uh, which encases this chamber. So well, that- Chris. Yeah? Sorry, Chris. You should be able to use your mouse pointer as a pointer on Does the screen. Work? That's it. Yes, we can oh, see that. right. I didn't realize I could do that. All right. Yeah. Okay. That's good. Okay. We'll just follow the life cycle of, uh, of, of one species just to illustrate the case. Uh, we're all familiar with the oak apple, Biorhiza pallida. Uh, it produces early spring and it's a sexual generation. The larvae in there will either become males or females. Um, they emerge in later in the summer, they mate, the females go to the roots and lay uh, eggs in the, uh, in, over in the roots and you produce this woody gall. Inside this woody gall are simply all female. So all of these uh, Cynipids, no, not all of the cynipids, most of the cynipids have this kind of alternating generation where there are females uh, only in the woody galls and there are sexual generation in fleshy galls that are produced in spring. It makes a biological sense. Uh, you want everything that survives uh, the hard times to be capable of reproducing. So they're all females. In most species, those females will produce sons or daughters, but not both. So this alternating generation is a very common feature amongst cynipids. It's not true of 100% of them. Right. This is a, a nice crop of oak apples. Came from a little tree near Brundish in Norfolk in 2006. I stood and counted the galls on this, and I got up to, to 7,000 and gave up. Um, but if you collect these galls and you incubate them, you get a variety of insects out. Now, this is not a speed reading test. So I don't expect you to read all of these species names. But what I'm trying to say is, look, there are oak galls, oak apple galls, produced by Ryder, Ryder pallida, but there are a lot of other things that got, kind of join in. And I'll illustrate that better on the next slide. We'll start, there's the gall causa, Biorhiza pallida. There are those that join in, Synergus and Synergus over there, and this beast at the bottom. These are lodgers. They eat their, their eat plant material. They don't particularly bother the Biorhiza pallida. Um, they are called inquilines, lodgers. But in addition to those, there are some nasty little beasts that lay their eggs in the larvae of the gall causa. These are endoparasites. There are those that lay their eggs on the, uh, the, the gall causa. And you can see there's quite a variety of those. Uh, these are ectoparasites. Uh, they're mainly all uh, wasps, the hymenopterans, related in the same sort of general group as Biorhiza pallida, uh, but they're different in sizes and so on. And you'll notice down at the bottom there, Eulogymnus, that's this beast down the bottom here, also decides he likes living on, or she likes living on the lodges as well. But in addition to that, there are those parasites that live on the parasites. There's a couple of species there. Uh, so I said at the beginning, I was going to look at galls as not only a good place for the gall causer to live, but it's a pretty good place for a load of other things. Now, I'd like to just pick on one species and that's this one here. And I can never, I never know whether to pronounce that with a hard C or a low, uh, or a soft C. We, we argue about this in, in, in the study of galls. 
you know, is it Cecidology or is it Kekidology? Um, same thing here, this beast is a weevil. And I have a nice picture here of this weevil uh, boring into an oak apple. Um, the photograph was by somebody who called himself Pudding Four Brains, which uh, appealed to me. Uh, but this beast uh, bores away, eats out a, a chamber, and she lays her egg in that chamber, and the larvae lives as an inquilin, as a lodger. Uh, so it's quite a distinct organism uh, from the rest of the hymenopterans that seem to be invading uh, our oak apples. Marble galls, uh, well, I have to be careful what I say here because I always have a story that these were introduced in this country in 18, 1833 uh, for producing tannins for staining seal skins because that was the story that I read. Uh, but Brian, who's with us tonight, has recently researched this and has enlarged that this may not be quite the case. It's a, an introduced species anyhow. Uh, when it first came in, it took off like, like uh, lightning because there were no parasites for it, but it has built up parasites. Uh, there it is again. Um, I'm glad I actually given Michael Shinry, who's with us tonight, uh, acknowledgement of a photograph of his. And you can see there the, chain, uh, the, the, the exit hole for the gall causer. Chop one of these open, and that's a very, I think, a very nice illustration. This again, I think, is uh, Michael's photograph. There's the chamber which the gall causer lived in. Uh, look, no frass in there, and there's the exit hole. And these are chambers by more lodgers living around. A excellent example of inquilines of, of lodgers. Right. Now, one of the criteria, or the criteria that a, a parasite must have, it must be able to lay its uh, over in the right place. And I've just illustrated this with this nice torums there, which has a very long ovipositor and can penetrate a large gall. Um, but what we often forget is that not only the parasitoids that, that invade galls got to find the right place to ovipositor, they've got to have a way of escaping from the gall. Uh, so it's worthwhile looking at that. And here's an old marble gall that I had in, in my garage uh, the other, just before I start preparing for this talk. And you can see there are various exit holes of various sizes. There's some small ones. Uh, there's one there which has got a bit of frass in it, uh, a, um, an intermediate one. So, and historically, I would have said, okay, we find our marble gall. Uh, and we can look at the holes and we can know what's lived in it. It's a kind of uh, arch archaic record of uh, what's inhabited the goal. And you can see this one should have only a single exit hole. But I came across something probably over the last three or four years, uh, of which I, with lockdown this last year, uh, sort of intrigued me. I found quite a lot of marble galls in which the emerging gall wasp, this is uh, this piece here, Andricus calari, seemed to have got to the exit and not quite made it. And I thought, you know, that's rotten, isn't it? You know, you live there to develop, pupate, produce a, 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 an adult, bore your way out, and you get exhausted. On closer looking at this, actually these, several that I found were hollow. Uh, and if you, you can't see it on this particular picture, but there's actually a hole in it. And I thought, oh, you know, life's rough, isn't it? Uh, here's a, a gall wasp about to emerge, and there's some swinish organism standing on the gall, waiting for you to be trapped with an exit hole. And just before you can escape, digging their proboscis or whatever it is, uh, into your shoulder, head, and sucking out the content. But you'll notice that it doesn't quite get out. And I, I, I cut several of these galls open. 
And what I found is, and I've actually stained this one. It's not very elegant. It was just a, a felt tip pen, just stained where I cut. And you see, there's the gall chamber. There's the exit tunnel. And it didn't quite make it. It's a little bit narrow there. And it reminded me of something I'd read concerning some Gauls in America. This is from California. Uh, this is a Gaul uh, of uh, a species called Bassetta pallida, um, and it produces a stem gall, which causes a, like a chamber within the gall, uh, within the stem, uh, which swells a little bit, and eventually, when when the gall wasp matures, it bores its way out. Uh, there it is, boring its way out. But what's been discovered in America is there's a nasty little wasp called Euterus set, which actually is an endoparasite that seems to be able to control this insect, uh, its host, such that when it's got to this stage of almost boring out, it says stop. And it carries on, the, the endoparasite carries on eating away at this uh, wasp from the inside, only to emerge later. So, this is what's called the crypt keeper wasp. Uh, now, I just wonder if we've got similar things which have not been reported in this country that uh, affect marble gall, uh, the Andricus calari. So that's a nice little project for later on to look at. That's a uh, set uh, photograph. It's not mine um, because we don't have it in this country, but you can see it's a fairly typical um, Childhood type organism. Uh, Set is the Egyptian god of war, chaos, and storms. It seems to me that that's pretty aptly named. Okay, let's, uh, that's, uh, I think, probably new to most. I'll move on. Right, galls are such a nice place to live, uh, as we might expect. Cherry galls here. Uh, this is a photograph from Tom Higginbottom. Um, we'd expect parasites to be. Uh, sorry, um, be uh, overpositing in the gall or in the larvae that's inside this gall. But that's food in there. And uh, Maggie Frankham, who some of you will know, and I were out at uh, Ratcliffe, uh, Ratby, um, at Burroughs Wood, and found lots of uh, cherry galls with these peck holes, very characteristic peck holes of great tits. Uh, and so not only have our gall causes, our cynipids got to survive attack by insects of other sorts, uh, but they've also got to watch out for the, those things with feathers that might eat into them and also mice as well. This is again a, a, a familiar gall to many, um, but we ask ourselves why this fluffiness, why this cotton-like? And the only sort of explanation that I've come across is that really, again, this is a device to stop parasites from, parasitoids from laying their eggs in the sensitive gall chamber where the wasps are. So can you imagine you're a nice invading torimus, you're crawling around on this cotton wool bowl uh, and you're trying to ovipose it down into the chamber you've got to have a pretty long overpositor or a lot of patience to get to it. So in a similar kind of way, this might be the case uh, with the Robin's pincushion gall. You see all this fibrous business here, does that inhibit various types of parasites from actually being able to get to the gall chamber? I've noted here, note the coloration, mention this a bit later. Okay, so one way of trying to stop people in others invading your gall is to make it hairy, big. An alternative strategy is to make the gall rock hard. Now, this is the cooler nut gall produced by Andrew Crystal Nicholas, and it's a, a rock hard, really hard gall. <laughs> the name implies lignic, uh, ligna, uh, lignicolus implies this lignin-like material. When we're out on field trips, I usually find this is quite 
common, pick one or two and asked the novices to put their thumbnail into the, the goal and they will realize how hard these are. So maybe a strategy for some uh, goal causes uh, to stop parasites or reduce the parasitoid population is to make the goal rock hard. Current goals, common current goals, which are the spring goal, sexual generation of Neurotus quercus baccarum. And this goal, which was the first goal that I first found that for myself, this is in uh, 58 years ago, I found these and took them to a schoolmaster and said, what are these? Um, the reason I've included these is uh, that not only do they have to protect themselves from parasitoids that invade the goal, they also have to protect themselves from the greys on them. And this particular little midge, a parallel diplosis galliopurda, grazes away under the common spangle galls. Um, about, about three years ago, we did a little experiment at one of the gall society's workshops where we were counting the proportion, measuring the proportion of spangled galls that were affected by this way. And typically we were getting figures like 80, 90, 95% of spangled galls in particular uh, collections were invaded by this organism. They graze away underneath. Um, they cause the galls to bulge up at the top uh, and almost invariably uh, result in the death of the gall causer. Um, I'm well known to do what's called rough and ready citizen science. This is a uh, little fun experiments uh, to see what happens. Uh, and if you collect these little midge larvae and put them on a fresh leaf, which hasn't got any of them with spangled galls, you can watch them within about 10 minutes all disappearing under spangled galls. And for the most part, there will only be one larvae per gall. Uh, we sometimes find more, but uh, they seem to stake ownership. But the attacks come from the inside, they come from the outside. And the other reason I want to include um, spangled galls, I used to always describe spangled galls as leaving the leaves, just hissing and falling to the ground before the leaves. And you can see these little white specks on this picture. These are spangled galls in the leaf litter. Um, you might think, well, why is a picture of a pheasant on the other side there? Well, I'm a Norfolk boy, and if you're a Norfolk boy, you've invariably, invariably got uh, relatives that are poachers. And uh, some of these uh, poached pheasants, if you open them, the crops will always be full. If there was a good crop of uh, spangled galls, would be uh, full of spangled galls. So spangled galls provide an important form of food for, for pheasants. But the other reason for putting this picture up is that I used to always describe this situation as being very sensible. Spangled galls fall and then the leaf litter falls on top of it, protects them for the winter. Uh, makes sense. However, if you actually dig into the leaf litter, about now, you will find that these spangled galls are embedded in a sea of nematodes and fungal hyphae. The leaf litter is rotting away. Um, so these spangled galls must have a way of protecting themselves against the attack of nematodes, of uh, microfungi and, and the like. Um, okay, they're behaving rather like seeds, aren't they? You know, they're protected. Okay, so the winter hazards. Moving on. Smooth spangled galls. Uh, these are quite nice. These are also invaded by uh, little external uh, midges, uh, xenodiplosis. Um, but the reason I've included these is that I could put this slide up. Uh, this is two pictures of Neurotrus albicus go, the smooth spangled gall. Because when I first gave a talk to Lester Litton Phil, at the end of the talk, some nice lady said to me, why are they often red? And at the time I couldn't answer it. Uh, I didn't know, but a bit of research shows that a lot of galls turn red if they're in the sun. And 
for the majority of these, the pigments where, where they have been analyzed, the red is caused by a group of compounds called the anthocyanins, which are flavonoids, accessory plant pigments. And it's known that anthocyanins are protectants against oxidation, especially caused by strong sunlight causing ionization of chemicals, which then uh, react uh, and destroy them. So what's happening is that these, spangle, these smooth spangled galls in the sun have got kind of um, a sun block built in to protect them. The anthocyanins also are known to reduce the fecundity of some insects. So some of the varieties of uh, plants we grow in our gardens um, have uh, more or less anthocyanins and they are regarded as protectants against certain types of insect attack. So maybe anthocyanins in galls uh, may have some as a sunblocker uh, protected uh, properties, but also it may protect them against uh, parasitoids to some extent. Right, I'd like just to show you four types of things that are called smooth spangle galls, all thought to be caused by um, Andricus, sorry, Neurotrus albipes. Uh, there's this one at the top here, which is uh, the common one that we find. This one, uh, well, this I've used to find quite a lot. I used to go to the Netherlands quite a lot to teach. Uh, and this I used to find in droves around a place called Etten Leur, uh, which is near Bredar. Then you get this version, which is the Lusitania variety. And then this one, which was first described by Philip Entwistle, who was a Gould Society member, uh, and he found it in Scotland. But we find, I find all four of these in some parts of the UK now. Um, are they really all Neurotras albipes, or are they species, separate species? No one really knows. Uh, but I thought I'd just share that with you that, uh, well, what we think of as Neurotras albipes is quite different from what some other people elsewhere in the, uh, around Europe might think of them as albipes. Right. Another common uh, cyanophid gall is uh, the silk button galls. And you can see on the picture on the right, that uh, the leaf has been uh, shredded by some uh, probably moth uh, larva, but it might be sawfly. And the galls are left. And, and this is quite commonly seen in, in galls. Why whoever's eating this leaf doesn't eat the gall, um, we don't know. It might be a physical thing that they can't get their jaws around it, or it might be a chemical thing. Um, more tricks amongst the cynipids uh, to avoid parasitism. Uh, this is a, a pea gall of a particular type caused by cynips districta. And you can see there are two chambers. This chamber here is where the larvae lives. And this is a sort of like an atrium above. And the story, goes that if you're a parasitoid with your ovipositor and you stick it through here, you're trying to find a, a host larvae and you can't, it's not there. You think you've got into the chamber, it's down here. And maybe, maybe this double chamber is a cunning little device to reduce the parasitoids in these. In a similar vein, this Andricus cavata on oak, uh, you can see there's little galls that are inside, like pee in a pod. And if you're a parasitoid, you've got to push your ovipositor in and you've got to get it into this gall, which is on a stalk and it's wobbly. So internal galls look to me like they might be uh, a way of protecting against parasitoids. Uh, I thought I'd drag this one in because it's such a nice picture. This is from... Uh, New England, it's not a British one, but you can see the same sort of phenomena. Why produce this large structure with these fine threads with the gall chamber in the middle there? If you're a, a torimus wash and you've got wasp and you've got an ovipositor, you've got to go down here, but you know, you don't really find very much, do you? So it might be a, another device. 
Another way of trying to protect yourselves against parasitoids is to recruit mercenaries. Um, if you can see on this particular slide, there's a gauze of Andricus quercus cortices. This is in the bark. You can see that they're erupting there. And these produce a honeydew, which attracts ants. And it's thought that in return for the honeydew, the ants will see off predators, uh, sorry, parasites, or even predators for that matter, but parasites. Um, so they're sort of kind of like mercenaries. Um, seems like a good plan. It's quite common. Here's one you can see uh, a nice gall, honeydew producing, and here are the ants surrounding it. And you think if you're a little Torimus wasp and you come down and you want to oviposit it in this gall and you land there, guess what? You're going to be eaten by those uh, ants within an, a blink. Right, getting towards the end of these. Uh, types of devices. And another way of protecting yourself against potential parasites is to make your tissues unpalatable, unsavory. Uh, and this is uh, Andricus infectorius, which uh, some of you were with us when we found this for the first time uh, in 2016 at Sharnwood Lodge Reserve. Uh, Ian Farmer, who's with us tonight, was the keen-eyed boy, um, but it had been found in Cornwall as well, it's, it's here. And these are extremely rich in tannin. When I say extremely rich, um, marble galls are thought to be quite good in tannin. A, chuck, uh, a lady called um, Fagin uh, determined there was about 17% by dry weight of uh, marble gall as tannin. These have up to 70%. These are really beautiful, and we used to import them to stain them, uh, for staining devices and for making ink and, and, and the like. Um, now, these are very, very common in the Middle East. And we talk about the Aleppo Gaul from Syria. There's a, an Israeli type Gaul, there's a Lebanon type Gaul and so on. They're, they're right they're rampant through uh, the Middle East. And because they've been used in trade and because they come from different uh, sites and because uh, we didn't know much about the biology and the use of these terms were uh, uh, these, these organisms, naming of these organisms. Um, if you look at the fauna Europea, these have, go by 56 different synonyms. So when I say the challenging world of plant gauze, that's another challenge, not just the insects, the gall causes being attacked. But for us poor gall interest team, goodness me, it's difficult to sort out all the names. Uh, Brian, who's with us tonight, has been doing a checklist of these things. And uh, he used to look a young man. He's uh, certainly doing different of late. I'm almost finished with my cynipids. And this cynipid, uh, you're or familiar with. And the reason I put this in, this is a newly introduced thing. It came into this country in about 1964. It became explosively in terms of number, but it's recruiting parasitoids. They're recruiting from the local population. Uh, it, and this seems to be the norm for new invasions by alien um, gall causes, cynipid gall causes that they recruit parasitoids from the local population. That's what the gall looks like inside. There's the chamber. Uh, there's all this callus. And you find inquilines living here and you get parasitoids living there. My final cynipid is Neurotris saliens. First appeared in this country in 2006. Looks like a slug. And we often call it a slug gall. It doesn't move. Uh, it's uh, um, attached, it's actually physically attached to the, uh, to the petiole. But at the end of the season, they dehiss and they drop. Uh, and here's a few in the hand of a colleague, uh, Jerry Bowdry from Colchester, a Gore Society member. Now just watch this little movie, just watch them for a minute. Oh, there's a flick. And if you keep watching for a second or two, you will see they jump. So Neurotrosalians is a jumping gall. 
is that a defense against something trying to eat it on the ground? Don't know. Um, the word salience means uh, jumping. My the alternate generation to the slug gall is this beast here, which is quite uh, distinct, isn't it? It's uh, very different from the other gall, amazing structures. Okay, so I'll summarize my defense mechanisms amongst the cyanipid gall causes. Produce large galls, challenging the overpossible length of parasitoids. Chemical changes, fill it up with tannins or anthrocyanins, make it unpalatable, might be a way of stopping parasitoids. You can hide the galls, perhaps in roots, or you can make them internal, double chambers, suspended galls. Or you can recruit mercenaries, a uh, bit of honeydew and get the ants involved. Uh, or you can produce hopping galls, whatever that does. Are these defense mechanisms successful? Well, in principle they are, because these species are still around. In practice, however, just about every scientific gall that's been examined, there are always parasitoids associated with them. So all we can conclude about that particular group is that there's probably a co-evolution. I'm gonna rattle on to aphid galls. Uh, we all know what an aphid is. Uh, we all know that uh, predators of aphids are ladybirds larvae and the larvae of uh, hoverflies. And in fact, there's some wonderful videos on the, on the net on YouTube of hoverfly larvae eating them. If we look at a, a population of, of uh, aphids uh, on a leaf gall, this is on red current, almost invariably associated with them are ants and the larvae of um, sort of, of hoverflies and of uh, ladybirds. But it's not these sort of open galls I want to look at, it's these closed ones. This is a, a young gall, again, as this is one of uh, Munkel's slides, and this is older where it's drying out and there are uh, exit uh, routes for the, for the aphids. Now, in these galls, you get large numbers. They live genuinely as a colony. And as a colony, I mean that there are aphids at various stages of the growth cycle. They're reproducing and so on. And towards the end of the season, they produce a winged version, which exit the gall and go to their winter quarters. Now, I want to look into this, um, these closed galls. In each of these, and these are two on uh, Poplar, uh, Pemphigus, Bussarus gall, and Spirothes, so these are quite common. Inside there will be lots of, of, of aphids feeding and uh, reproducing. Uh, and when you've got a colony, there's a prospect of being able to share labour. And one of the features of these types of galls is that there's a soldier class. So if we look in the gall, there are lots of lots of, of aphids feeding in. And there are soldier aphids. And these ones from Pemphigus uh, attack caterpillars. Um, this is a moth caterpillar, but they will also have a go at uh, hoverfly um, larvae. And they stick their stylus in. Yeah, just about see it there. And they don't go through multiple stabbings. They 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 give it a stab and then they shake like mad, kind of doing the damage that you might expect from a dum-dum bullet. Yeah. So the soldier ants, uh, aphids, sorry. They're not always successful. This is a, a, a gall that uh, we cut open at one of our meetings, a uh, gall site meeting. And this larvae here, you can see typically is a, a hoverfly larvae with its two stylets. Uh, Spireth keeps at the end, um, and that hasn't been terrible. So, so the soldiers do do a job, uh, but they're not always successful. Go abroad for a bit, and here's another uh, aphid gall. Uh, this is these multiple pockets of aphids, and they're narrow necks, and they produce soldier um, cast. But in this case, they don't stick their stylets in. They pr produce 
a very hard sclerotic head portion with these spikes and they plug up the narrow gap. Uh, so it's a head plug defense uh, goes on. Uh, that's, that's amazing, isn't it? Let's go further abroad, and here's a, a, a goal on a, a, one, a member of the witch hazel family. And this particular goal has been chomped into by a moth larva. You see this hole. And of course, the, the aphids don't like that. So they send their soldiers up, and here's a row of soldiers, yeah, lining up. Let's see what happens on the next slide, what happens. These soldiers start excreting, secreting, I should say, uh, globules, a gooey mix, right? And they completely seal it up. Now that gooey mix will contain an enzyme called phenol oxidase. It contains a number of proteins, contains the amino acid tyrosine and so forth. Um, it's a pretty destructive process on the, on the soldiers. Uh, some of them get trapped outside. You'll see the odd one disappear outside at the beginning. There he goes, he's going to get lost. Uh, some of them drown. Most of them become dehydrated, but it's a pretty good uh, plug to plug up uh, an aphid uh, colony's home. My final little group, mites. Right. We know they're small, uh, general size about 120, 180 micrometers. Now that probably doesn't really mean very much, it's just a size. But if I tell you that if you take a pencil and put two dots on a, on, on a piece of paper and they are less than 0.2 of a millimeter apart, they will look like a single dot. I mean, it's the principle of photographic uh, photographs in newspapers, the dotted uh, pictures. So another way of saying that is that these beasts are just a bit too small to see with the naked eye. And you'll notice that these mites, all, all the mites that produce galls in this particular group, the area fired mites, uh, have four legs, which is sort of unusual. We tend to think of them as um, belonging to the same groups of spiders, the arachnids and uh, ought to have eight, but the four legs and they're at one end. They feed, uh, that's not a head, it's called a rostrum, uh, through these, what are called chelicerea. Uh, and really they, they're like two little pneumatic drills. They'll, they'll channel away, uh, alternating, and chop a hole into a plant cell. These beasts, are not designed to escape pred predation by anything trying to attack them. They've only got four legs, it's a long body, it's going to be a bit of a drag. Uh, they don't produce wings and they don't penetrate plants' material. They sit on the surface of cells. Um, so they're exposed. So these mites only really have one strategy to avoid being attacked, and that's to hide. Okay, so that's, well, I've put a list here of the things that are known to attack aerified mites, gall causing mites, uh, flies, beetles, uh, and so on and so forth, and a load of mites themselves. They're, they're everybody's favorite food. The gall causes, well, the free living ones, the vagrants, uh, tend to live in sort of between the sheath and leaf of grasses. They hide in between the scales, just in, in buds and so on. Forth. They, they, their life is spent hiding. Um, I can illustrate that for yourself because we've all got mites on us. Uh, it's mum's first gift to us when we're born. We get these mites and they'll be living in, we've all got them, uh, in our hair follicles. They'll all be perhaps head down or rostrum down, sucking away at the ceramide, the wax and the oils that uh, are being secreted by the hair follicle, um, well into the hair follicle. Probably about five or six 
to more or less every hair follicle. It doesn't matter whether you wash your hair in vocine or whatever. Okay, now these species can, if they produce galls, typical felts. And if we look at these felts, they consist of trichomes or hairs, which are very dense. Uh, and they can be fibrous or they can be globular. And well, any of you gall uh, searchers, I'll ask you, have you been successful in finding mites in these, these felts? You know they're there, you can go down with your microscope, uh, but they're damn difficult to find. Um, and you can think about this. I, I've actually sat and watched some of these felts for a very long time. And occasionally the gall cause will come to the fringes to extend the tray and they're susceptible to pr predation there. You can watch the predator mites and they hit the forest and they don't get in. So that's one way of hiding, producing a felt. Uh, the galls themselves feed either on the trichomes, uh, the, these hairs, or they um, uh, live on the um, epidermal cells of, the, of, the, of the, the host plant. Similar thing applies here. This is getting a bit more complex now uh, of a gall. I think most of us are familiar with Aerophyes similis on blackthorn. Um, and you find that they produce two types of, of trichomes. This is the sort of leaf fold. And you can see that they're fibrous types and they're globular types. These ones are eaten and these are defensive. So if we take the leaf curl, there it is, stylized, that's the open bit. The fibrous ones are at the mouth and they kind of protect it. And these rather globular ones are on the inside uh, and the mites feed on them. Okay. Pouches are very similar. Most of you will be familiar with this on maple, uh, Acerium macrochelis, or similar but rather smaller ones on sycamore. Uh, you get similar things on lime, Erifies tillae. Now, my mites in here are still living on the surface. Uh, they're inside the gall, uh, but underneath is this plug. So the epidermis goes into the pouch and back out. Uh, the mites are in the pouch. They're actually in here. We'll look at one or two of those in a moment. Um, but plugged by these fibrous types. And I've called this a, like a portcullis. And that portcullis uh, prevents parasitoids getting in. If you cut one of those galls, you find the mites in there feeding away. Uh, and they're eating uh, from the nutritious tissues that are in there, and that's fine. Here comes another one of those rough and ready citizens science. Uh, does the portcullis really protect them? Well, this is a portcullis. This is a, the underside of a gall that I stuck a, a, a brush bristle in, and you can see I've damaged it. And this is a predatory mite uh, accessing via the damaged portcullis. Yeah, so I've damaged the entry. It wasn't very fine. I've done, it, did, I've done it with several. And if you look in these galls sometime later, the gall causer is gone. And these beasts have taken over. These are eight-legged uh, mites. I don't know what the species are. So galls are really quite divisive. Now, in the last two minutes, I'm going to look at this beast, uh, Aceria campestricola on elm. This gall, if those people who know have seen this, are always found in clusters. Why is that? Well, if you look on the underside, that's the underside, it's like a conical and it's like a, a volcano. Uh, this one doesn't have hairs. If you look on the, um, in the keys, the Br British plant galls like keys, you'll find that some of them do produce hairs. Uh, but I've drawn this style, this bit. Here's the leaf lamella and you follow the epidermis, it goes round and round and in and the mites live on the surface of that. Uh, it's not sealed but it's closed. Right, so the gall cavity is there, the gall causes are, are in there eating this or sucking this um, 
nutritive tissue. That's the upper surface and this conical lower bit. Okay. If you go late autumn and take lop one of the lobes off, you can see they're absolutely stashed full of mites. Um, these are brown and white ones. There are two, two sort of types that are known, protogynes, which tend to be the young juvenile growing, and deutogynes, which will be the ones that will migrate. And I think that the difference in the coloration of these is largely due to uh, things like storage of lipids and so on. Ready for. Now, there's these mites in a leaf, and winter's going to come, and the leaves are going to drop off. Uh, what are these mites going to do? If they go with the leaf, can you imagine them 10 meters from the, the tree, 0.15 of a millimeter long, and they've got to crawl back to the tree to be there ready for next year? Nope, they have no option. They must leave the gall. Uh, and as the leaf starts to dry, the mites begin to emerge. There's one with its uh, little legs poking out. You can see them crawling out of the, the gall. Um, these I took this year with a little 20, the 30 pound USB microscope, not BBC quality, but I think it does. And there's a lot of them. They migrate, they crawl out and they tend to follow the, the leaf veins. If there's any uh, trichomes hairs, they'll try and protect themselves uh, by following that line. And they really do migrate in, in, in large numbers. Occasionally they'll do sit on their backsides and they'll hang out like that way and wave their arms about. And that's thought that they might catch up with an insect, a, a fly that might transport them to other plants. But the majority of them are going to head down. Uh, and it's a bit, you go back, a bit like the wildebeest on the Serengeti. Uh, they just have to take their chances. Uh, they're going to be exposed as they're migrating. Of course, it's not crocodiles uh, and the like now. It's going to be these predatory mites. Uh, I have some short uh, video sh shots of these actually devouring migrating mites. So the mites are heading down. They're a bit like the migrating wildebeests. And the first thing they want to do when they get off the leaf is to hide. And there they are at the bottom of a, the base of a bud, right? You can see it and you can see the little, le little legs there. They're, they impact in numbers. And I estimate that some leaves uh, produce something like four to 5,000 mites. And while they're at the base of the uh, bud, some of them will try and creep in and occasionally they do get in between leaf scales and they're going to be on those leaves for next year. So once you've got them, they tend to hang around quite a bit. You can see that there are a number of them. This is a crack in what we call wings on, on a, um, ulnus uh, and it's ulnus, sorry. And uh, they are packed in numbers. I'm currently trying to follow what's going to happen uh, with these later on. Okay, so these beasts want to hide, they've got a challenge, they want to stay with the tree, they don't want to go with the leaf, they take their chances, they'll do the stampede down, down the leaves and back onto, uh, onto, the, onto the trunk. Okay, well, I've done a mad gallop through the challenging world of plant galls. You can see that, uh, well, there's a lot of different devices going on, trying to protect themselves from predators, uh, trying to hide, uh, producing soldiers, lots and lots, uh, producing uh, honeydew to get mercenaries and so on. I've simply covered less than 2% of the species of uh, British plant, go uh, plant galls. And there are a lot of other different mechanisms going on. There's plenty of things to look for. Um, okay, I hope you found that interesting. We must call it an end. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, uh, we'll. Um, uh, are you happy to take some questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, do you want to uh, maybe maybe turn your slides off now? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Stop sharing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If you like, if you've got a question for Chris, um, you can either um, wave at me uh, or type it in the chat window, um, or um, 
uh, just just put your microphone on and try asking. I'm sure we'll have some questions. It's a, a bit of a gallop because uh, <laughs> no, it's very good. It's very good. I, I've got a question while people are thinking up uh, their questions. Um, you, you've talked about various human uses for galls, um, mm. particularly uh, tannins. Um, the, the obviously a lot of the insects find them quite tasty. Um, are any galls edible? Do anywhere in the world do, do people actually eat any galls? Uh, they have done in the past. There's, there's a, uh, I can't remember what the proper name of it is now, but there was a, a, a gall uh, in China that was eaten, uh, which in the translation became food for the foolish, <laughs> which doesn't sound terribly appetizing. Uh, it's a see something that I can't remember the names, but they, they are items of commerce in. in uh, um, China, particularly, um, the aphid galls produce a lot of tannins, and they deliberately raise the galls. Uh, they get the aphids to live on moss over winter, collect the aphids from the moss, and then make sell little packets of aphids uh, that are hung in orchards, uh, pistachio orchards, to produce galls, which are then extract the tannin. I mean, that's totally different to a, a Western way of thinking. Fancy growing moss, fancy growing aphids, and, you know, to, to produce a product. We, we're not into that. <laughs> I suppose the closest we get to that is something like uh, silk moths for uh, yeah. <laughs> it's another yeah. Chinese product, of course. But uh, yeah. Yeah. OK, so um, I don't know if anybody else has got any questions. Thanks for that, Chris. I think Alan is, Alan Bevington's waving at you, Alan. The other Alan, yes. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, that, that, that was very interesting. Thank you very much. The, um, um, I was very interested to hear you say that in cherry galls, the gall causer is sometimes predated by great tits. Yeah. Uh, is much known about how common this is? Is it just great tits? Or, or, or do other species, other bird species do this as well? Um, the other galls are certainly uh, attacked by other birds. I mean, nuthatches uh, go for marble galls, uh, for instance. Uh, in the particular case that I said that Maggie and I found up at Burroughs Woods, um, there was a particularly good crop of, uh, of cherry galls that year. Uh, and we were doing a scout to see if we could arrange a meeting, uh, you know, was it a good place to, to take uh, people? And it was, it, we were doing this in autumn, uh, ready for the next year. And every single cherry gall on the ground had been pecked, right? Every single one. So uh, once they got their eye in, uh, the birds were going for it. But, you know, there are, there are other things like mice. Um, there are galls in the, the flower heads of um, knapweed, for instance, and uh, uh, I've, I've found mice in my collection, <laughs> you know, t taking them out. <laughs> yeah, it's all meat. So it sounds as if at least sometimes that this, that this can be quite an important item in the, in the diet of the birds, possibly. Well, I think, I think it is. It, you know, uh, I guess it depends on the air and it depends on the gall and the frequency of the gall. I mean, we do know that some of these uh, gall populations do crash uh, when, well, I think probably I was trying to hope that my parallel to Pelusas eating at the outside of Bangal galls might be a predicting a crash, and it kind of did. But I mean, on the common Spangal gall, for instance, um, in 1990, we had a crash, and I estimated the crash was something like 10 to the 7 power. If you take that into human populations, you've got the British population, um, it would be reduced to seven or eight next year. Uh, and that must lead to quite a <laughs> dramatic genetic drift. Thankfully, COVID isn't that bad yet. Oh, that's yeah. right. That's yeah. right. That's, uh, yeah, it's uh, actually, I, I, I was going to say that the mites are probably the first, first to introduce uh, social distancing. Um, when, when they mate, uh, the, the males uh, produce the spermatophytes on a stalk. And this is a bit like a, a, a mini pin, uh, uh, pin mold head, but very small. 
and walks off. And the female comes along, and her genitalia is halfway along the body. She goes on to the top of it to absorb the spermatocytes to take in the flat. So this is uh, sex, socially distant sex, uh, which I think <laughs> was uh, quite an interesting concept. And there are actually papers that talk about what criteria female mites have in selecting their spermatophyte heads. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. That's very welcome. interesting. Um, Chris? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. No, I don't. I, the, one little question. In, 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 in Synapse Disticia, yeah. two chambers, how does that upper chamber develop? Do you know? No. Why does it not close up? No, no it doesn't close up. No, it doesn't close up. No, what no, stops it? It doesn't up. Um, and the. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, the, you know, we, we know with synipid galls, they are really very distinct. Fortunately, they are for us gallers because we can identify them. Why are they distinct? Because presumably they're trying to evolve not to be like each other. Yeah, yep. I just wonder how that chamber, I don't know, nothing in it is, is I don't is, know. How, how does that work? How does it actually occur? Could, you see, it could be sort of like the beginnings of uh, Cuvata, where you've got an outer chamber and an, an inner chamber, you know, you could almost imagine that becoming um, a little ball within a bigger ball. Yeah. Yeah. You follow me? Yeah. yeah. Um, pass. Um, no, thank you, Chris. I've got to leave this now. Uh, I regret, uh, uh, but I will say thank you very much for your talk. And uh, I thought it was really interesting. And I say hello to everybody and happy new Goodbye. year. <laughs> I have to go. Thanks very much. Bye bye, bye, -bye now. Thanks. Well, that's one vote of thanks. We'll have others, no doubt. But we've got time for a couple more questions first, if Chris is happy to take them. Yeah. Can I ask one? Yeah. Um, all right. I'll just before, I think it was before the talk started when you were, when we were chatting, um, Chris, you mentioned Brox Hill and Lucas Marsh. Yeah. And... I didn't. I didn't catch all of that. But you said something about hundred and something species. Was that species of gauls? Species of gall. Yeah. Spe hundred and something species uh, of gall. Uh, uh, Ian's in 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 the crowd, and he probably got a better number because he made he kept the records. But it, it was a hundred and something. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Thank but you. See, you can get 30, 40, 50 different species on oaks. Yes. Um, mites, there are about, about nearly 400 uh, species of uh, gall forming mites in this country, and they're all more or less host specific, and there aren't many hosts that don't get mite affecting them. You know, they do add up. Yeah. Right. You add all the rusts, you know, uh, that produce galls. Quite a different phenomenon yes. from the ones I've talked tonight. But uh, um, yeah. Ian, are you there? Can you? Can you remember the number? It's probably still, still mute. <laughs> Doesn't matter. I, it, 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 I can't remember the exact number. Um, no, no. Uh, there, I, I could check it for you because we did write it up and it's in one of the society journals that uh, the ones we've I don't need an exact number. I'm just no, impressed with no. a hundred. Um, well, well it's, it's very interesting because when people start looking for goals, if you go along with sort of, let's call them experts, people who are familiar with goals, you start adding new species to the things that you can look for. You know, I used to always walk straight past horse chestnuts, the new goals on that, wrong. You know, somebody showed me and we find that. And the first goal society meeting, which was held in uh, a field meeting, held in uh, 1986, we found 26 species and we thought, wow, that's a good day. If we go now, it depends on, on the site you go to. If you're not finding 50, 60, 70 species, I mean, Bosworth Field uh, a few years ago, we found 88 species in a day. Yeah, so, you know, they're, they're around, but you need to sort of get your eye in. Yeah. If, if I go abroad, I find four species because I'm not familiar with the plants. I exaggerate, but you know, it's, uh, it's mm. that, that kind of way. Yeah. 
Cool. Okay, Chris. Um, I think at this point, I'm going to say uh, thank you once again for a fascinating talk. I think this is probably the third Gaul talk um, I've, I've heard from you give. Um, they've all been different. Um, I don't think... I remember what I've said, you say. You've co you haven't covered the same thing twice in, in any of them. So um, an excellent talk. Um, certainly an encouragement for everyone to keep their eye open. So uh, thank you very much, Chris. That was a great talk. We all enjoyed it.